Welcome, everyone, and thank you for taking part in this meeting on Jérôme Lejeune, a doctor in Genesis, discovered trisomy 21, the cause of Down syndrome. Tonight, our speaker will be Oduga, postulator of the cause of verification and canonization, and we will present the testimony of Umbretta Salvucci, researcher in the US, who will tell us about her friendship with Birte, who carried out the mission of her husband, Jerome, for scientific research and the defense of human life. Before starting, I wanted to greet the Italian, English and Spanish-speaking audience. I leave the floor to Aude. Thank you. Buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy about talking about Jérôme Lejeune, a great geneticist and a great science, scientist that has died in 1994, almost 30 years ago. I'm a postulator for his cause of canonization. For 10 years, I've been a postulator. Two years ago, in 2021, the Church proclaimed him as venerable and so has recognized his virtues and his heroism. And now we are waiting uh, the miracle for the beatification. But why this geneticist he is considered venerable, but let's say also a saint, or at least that's what I think. I just want to explain to you that he was a man with a light within. He had a magnificent, magnificent gaze, and the first thing that um, people tell me about him when I ask them about Jerome. I've never met him, but uh, I've been working on his life for more than 10 years. And I lived, in, I lived and worked uh, for the Jerome Lejeune Foundation. I've known his wife because I've worked with her. And I had the luck to read his letters, his personal diary, live in his home, we could say. And I really knew uh, his family, his friends, and all the doctors who, who have worked with him, and also all the children he took care of. I also carried out a research for the cause of canonization. And the amazing thing is that we see a simple man, and this is really amazing because he was a doctor, he was a secular, he was a scientist, he was married and had five children. He uh, lived in Paris. So he's not a saint from another century that had a life different from the ones we have. We have some trouble sometimes in saying uh, I could be a saint, uh, but a saint like Joan of Arc or like uh, San Francesco from Astesi. Obviously, they are amazing saints. But for me, it is a bit different to compare my life to theirs. While with Lejeune, which was a married man, a generalist, a scientist, we can do this comparison. So what has made his life saint? We can say his intelligence and his heart, but let's start from the la this last one. He uh, has always had this vocation uh, of becoming a, um, a doctor. He started in Paris in a famous hospital with a huge uh, figure of, um, of pediatrics. He was a pediatrician and took care of those uh, children that at the time were called um, were called people affected from Mongolism. These children were the shame of the family. I'm talking about um, I'm talking about the past. So there was nothing um, well known about this disease. These children were hidden. They told. Uh, 
uh, that this uh, disease was terrible, was a form of uh, disability. Um, they actually said that this was like a punishment from God for the sin of the family. So for the family, it was uh, already terrible having a, chi a child affected by this syndrome. But there was also the look of society that said, that, that blamed the family, the parents, the father, because maybe he sinned. So it was like a punishment from God. So it was really terrible. But when Jerome Lejeune met these, these children, had like a, had an immediately idea of giving, of giving and dedicating this life, his life to these children. So he wrote a beautiful letter to uh, her fiance at the time and that will have become his wife later on and wrote uh, this letter without speaking about the wedding, speaking about the gown of Mrs. Lejeune. He talked about an essential thing that was a religious vocation of their wedding and uh, he wrote because she came back to Denmark uh, that was her birth country to arrange the wedding and said that today in the, in, in the, hosp the hospital he met this huge pediatrician, this great pediatrician that proposed him to work with uh, uh, children affected by Down syndrome. He said, I'd like to find my vocation and find the cure, the treatment to take care of them. He, he said it will be my my duty, it will request a lot of sacrifice, but if you agree, I know that we will manage to reach my objective together. So it, it was the purpose of his life and her fiancé received this letter and said that she wanted to enter this mission at the service of these children. So we can say that they did it together. And the great thing, thing about this sanctity is that it was possible thanks to Mrs. Lejeune too, because she had always accompanied him, dedicated all her life to his, uh, her husband's work. So since then, Lejeune tried to understand why these children were like that and made this discovery and in fact, uh, he changed the word. It's n it was not Down syndrome, syndrome, but called that trisomy 21 because there were three chromosome 21 instead of two, as we have. So he called this disease trisomy 21 that was due to an extra chromosome. Today, it's quite normal for us, but at the time, in 1958, it was the first time in the world that they discovered this illness caused by an extra chromosome. That was the beginning of the knowledge about chromosomes and the first uh, disease like that. So it was a, a genetic revolution. That's why Lejeune was called also the father of modern genetic. Then he made a lot of other discoveries. And since then, worldwide, he was called, uh, he was called in to other countries in order to give to to become professor of genetic to be professor in their own universities but he always wanted to stay in france in order to take care of his patients that he had been known for years he didn't want to leave them them neither for money that in for example in the united states offered them he always said no he always refused he wanted to stay in france living a really uh, peaceful life without being rich being rich was not important for them their life was dedicated to these children they were not just children let's say let's call them patients because they were also adults so Lejeune, Lejeune welcomed these patients 
as a doctor, while in the afternoon also dedicated time to the research. He didn't just want to discover why they were like that, but also uh, he wanted to find a remedy, a cure to these uh, disease of the intelligence, as he called that. He loved these children, but he said that their intelligence was sick and it was a, a pain for them. So he wanted to relieve this pain. He said to give them back the freedom of intelligence they deserved. So he worked a lot in order to find the treatment, the cure, with a lot of love and affection. As I said in the beginning, the sanctity of Jérôme Lejeune was related to heart and intelligence. And here we can see the communion of this sanctity because loving by loving his patients, he showed uh, this uh, unconditional love towards them. And he also loved them with, they, with his intelligence. That was really uh, like a genius. So those that worked with him have always told me that he would have become a genius in everything, in math, in math field, in physics field. He was interested in everything, but every time he wanted to study something out of the genetic field, every time, as he, has, he had written in his diary, every time there's a mother or a children, that says to him, you know, professor, I we need you. When you will find the treatment, we will wait for you. So every time I will try to go out of the genetic field, I always I'm always dragged back in order to help these children. So he he always tried to stay in genetic to help these families so he really was at the service of uh, these children and these families so he was really like an angel he had a, he was a genius he had a huge intelligence and uh, he put his intelligence at the service of uh, children that had problems with their intelligence so that's what hit me the most about the figure of the gen. And then his intelligence, I will say, was really linked, uh, attached uh, to truth. He's, he was in love with truth. Why I'm saying so? Because when in France, but also everywhere else in the world, because as I already said, he was invited from each part of the world, from a meeting about genetics, a professor in many, he was professor in many universities, in universities around the world. He received a lot of awards, even the, fam the famous um, prize uh, of the, the Academia dei, dei Lincei, and also received the prizes in Switzerland, England, everywhere else. When uh, he, in the 70s, he understood that geneticists, uh, doctors, slowly started talking about choosing people that could, uh, that could uh, be born and those who could not, saying that thanks to the discovery of trisomy 21, they could see, they could uh, conduct prenatal tests in order to understand which were uh, the the children that had trisomy 21, he said, he said, no, this is the contrary of medicine. As doctors, we are at the service of patients. We cannot use our science to, to avoid children having birth. Having birth. So this was like a proof of his intelligence. We cannot do this, it's the contrary of science. So it was so clear for him that 
he could not he could not say the contrary and this gave him a lot of strength so this is the real strength of Lejeune he was a genius but he never used his science and power his career his money because he knew very well that in saying to the world to politicians to mass media even uh, in the scientific community he knew that if he would have been the one saying that abortion was not the solution and that he could not forbid, forbid them to leave he knew that uh, this would have caused him problems, but he did it the same way. So here we understand the virtue and the heroism of this figure. He could have stayed silent, not saying anything, taking care of children, not practicing abortion, but being quiet in order not to have problems. But instead, he knew also thanks to a child affected by trisomy 21 that went to his office in the hospital hugged him crying and say and saying professor you have to help us because without you we cannot make it and Lejeune asked the parents what what was happening and why the child was crying and the parents said that he watched the TV last night and said that the politician that had talked about abortion for people for ch children affected by trisomy 21 and he understood that he was talking about children like him so Lejeune came back home that day and said very sad and said to his wife that he had to defend them because if he needs to work as their doctor and natural advo advocate he needed to avoid these things happening and so he had to fight for their dignity how was uh, known around the world so there were more than uh, 10,000 people coming from all over the world to his office so obviously when a man like that that was the biggest geneticist in the world he had won a lot of prizes also the kennedy prize the allen memorial award the biggest american prize for genetic when a man like that with that scientific authority that love for his patients takes the defenses of children obviously his choice has a huge weight that's why he became the greatest defensor of life all over the world. Let's say that he lost a lot because since when he started defending these children, he lost a lot of things. He lost his hospital team. He, the, the French government um, did not give any more uh, resources. He lost the Nobel Prize for three times, and three times he was nominated. Three times they said no because it was against abortion, but he didn't care. The only thing he cared about were their patients. So by doing so, he lost a lot on the career point of view, but not in the medical field, not in the human life, because he always worked to defend these families. And then he was invited, not just in generic conferences around the world, but he was invited in a lot of important places, in parliaments, in, uh, in courts, uh, in order to witness about the beauty of human life. So he had a, a really important influence because he, he had the possibility to witness about the beauty of human life all over the world. So uh, he had the opportunity to go to Australia, Canada, US, so he really became a servant of human life, and that's why 
che mi piace molto parlare di lui. Really like uh, talking il, about him il ser, il servitore del verbo as incarnato. the servant ah, of in, the incarnated di, word di he really Sermani. loved the, e, the beginning of St. John's textbooks he was um, the servant of incarnated word la, because he really knew the beauty e, of Christian faith aveva capito, aveva he capito. He understood the, the mystery of incarnation and said that we could say that we believe in, a, in an incarnated God in Jesus and not taking care in of, of our brother incarnated here. And that's not possible. I really like talking about him as... I really like talking about him as a wise man. And as a, the wise man, he had a, a huge intelligence. He followed the star of intelli intelligence of science because he really was a scientist. He, he always wanted to comprehend things. So his intelligence, his science led him to kneel in front of fragile and weak children. And when government and power, powerful people said to him, come back to us thanks to your discoveries, we can take care of these children. He very well understood that it was not as they said, that his discovery would have been used against these children. And so he went towards another direction. He had a lot of problems, but by doing so, he did everything he could to protect these children. So he is like a fourth wise man. I am sorry, so because we are in the Lent period, so it's not so liturgic to say, but but he, to end my, my speech, Jérôme Lejeune was a, a real friend to John Paul II. They were close friends, and so he asked him to create the Pontifical Academy for Life. So Jérôme Lejeune wrote the articles for this academy, the text about the servants of life that every member had to sign before entering into the institution two years ago. This tradition was abolished, but up to two years ago, you had to sign before entering. And then Jérôme Lejeune died 33 days after the institution, the creation of this academy. And John Paul II will be nominated president and head and founder of this Pontifical Academy for Life. And 33 days after Legion died on the Easter day, and, and John Paul II wrote a beautiful letter saying that we cannot see, we, we, we can see a huge sign of the servant of life in the day of the resurrection. Thanks, Hod. Thank you so much. Today, we will show you uh, a brief video that tells the life of Legion through images. Thank you.
So now, you, now we will show you the testimony of Ombretta Salvucci that unfortunately could not be here tonight. The friendship with Birte began almost 12 years ago and was a pure gift, completely undeserved. In fact, when in Psalm 62 we read, your grace is worth more than life, I always think of this miraculous friendship. The meeting with Birte was organized in heaven about 13 years ago by her husband, Jérôme Lejeune, who 18 years after his death by pure miracle, became a real company for my life in a moment of professional crisis. In fact, during this very difficult working period from which I came out thanks to the help of Jerome, I had the idea of presenting the life of Jerome Lejeune at the New York Encounter 2011, which are three days of cultural events in the heart of Manhattan, through the testimony of his daughter Clara Gemma Lejeune, who at the time was Vice President of General Electric International and CEO of General Electric in, Fra in France. Accompanying Clara to New York, there were one of uh, her sisters and her mother, Birte. With her, I spent all the days of the New York event and I was immediately impressed by her vivacity and really intense gaze that was full of love and affection. Here at the New York encounter, Birte introduced me to a friend of hers that was a bishop from Latin America who celebrated Mass on Sunday and then quickly told the bishop about our meeting. Then, at last, that bishop said to me, please take care of Birte and all her family because she and Jerome are saints and everything that comes from them is holy. And I've obeyed these words all these years. A few days after returning to Paris from New York, Birte calls me and says, Omret, I wanted to thank you for your enthusiasm, for Jerome and for your faith. So come and visit me in Paris and you will be my guest. In those days, in March, in Paris, there was a lecture on Trisomy 21. So I went and I was a guest at Birte's house. During that meeting, I met Professor Pierluigi Stripoli from the University of Bologna. And I involved him in my friendship with Birte. I took him to Birte's house to Jerome's grave and for Pierluigi that was a really a dream because for years he had been teaching Jerome Lejeune to his students at the University of Bologna. This encounter with Birte became the origin of the whole story of the relaunch of his research on Trisomy 21 for Pierluigi and everything was inspired by the scientific thoughts of Lejeune. In fact, I must say that Birta's dedication to her husband's work, for me, for Stripoli, and for many others, was an, exa an example that brought us to her house in Paris every year, and where we also had the privilege of being able to read Jerome's personal diary, to ad admire all his handmade, handmade wooden creations, such as the structure of DNA, rosaries, boats, and so on. Birte always told us and always welcomed us with a lot of affection, told us stories about her husband, and gave Pierluigi advice on research on Trisomy 21, so that he could learn to observe and work as Jérôme Lejeune did. So she really loved us so much, trusted us, had a huge esteem for me, for my friends, and for this story. Every time we got there, she was always ready to help us to organize dinners, lunches, and unforgettable trips uh, towards uh, Jérôme's grave in Chalot Saint Mars, where more and more people came every year. For example, in 2000, in 2019. 
we were about 40 people, then there was a stop because of COVID. Although I came in Birta's life in recent years, I was really a daughter for her. And in fact, I miss her every day. The emails she wrote me were always full of a lot of affection and a lot of faith. And I always replied, telling her the beautiful things that happened around Jerome in the United States and in Italy. But at the same time, Birte was a very pragmatic person, full of vitality that never lost a minute for her mission. Therefore, her emails always ended saying, overwhelmed by work, I give you a big hug, and we unite always together in prayer. She was always very positive, very close, very attached to life, so much so that even in her last email in February 2020, when she announced the, the news of the cancer that hit her and from which she would no longer recover, she concludes the email saying, apart from this, I refer to the disease, I'm very well, I take the subway and I work every day. So when she turned 90 years old with a few friends, Pierluigi and also other friends from all over the world, we celebrated her and invited her to a restaurant where she had always dreamed of going that was close to her house, but she could never manage to go. It was a beautiful evening, and I remember that the next day she brought me always with her sensitivity, always full of gestures and affection towards us. She brought me and thanked me for going there with my friends, even coming from the US, and risking also our lives because those were the years of the terrorist attacks in Paris. And so she thanked me at the end of the letter and said, I want to thank Jerome for giving me such loyal friends. But for us, it was always great, great visiting her. A few days before her death, I received a video call from Clara with Birte. In the US, it was 4 a.m. or less, and that was really a great gift. Unfortunately, we could not travel because there was a stop due to coronavirus. The borders were closed, so I could not be with her at the time. So I had the opportunity to express all my gratitude and affection towards her. And she replied, sending me kisses with her hand, which she could hardly move. I'm sure that now she is in heaven. She continues to be super viral and active, as she promised me in a note she left before dying, where she said, referring to Jerome Lejeune Foundation, you are the most important thing of a work that Jerome has started. I know you won't stop after I will leave you. I will be with, with you in a different way. And God willing, with Jerome, we will protect uh, the patients, the Jerome Foundation and all the institution. And I'd like to add also on all of us. So she said, or oh, she concluded uh, saying a big hug with all my love, Birte. So together with my friends, I want to thank her for being an immense gift uh, in our lives. I'd like to thank Ombretta, and before leaving, I'd like to, to say that the registration of the meeting will be post posted in all the three language languages on the YouTube channel Sacre Questioni, so I will ask you if you want to subscribe in order to stay updated. And I'd like to thank, first of all, uh, Ode for her speech, Juan Pedro for the Zoom direction, Eleonora and Martina for the simultaneous translation, the photographic archive of the University of Navarra for uh, letting us use these images. And so I'd like to say goodbye and see you soon. Thank you.